Okay, chapter seven. Um, sometimes Harry noticed the hat shouted to the house at once, but other times it took a little while to decide. Finnegan Seamus, the sandy haired boy next to Harry in the line, sat on the stool for almost a whole minute before the hat declared him as a Gryffindor. Granger, Hermione. Hermione almost ran to the stall and jammed the hat eagerly on her head. Gryffindor, shouted the hat. Ron groaned. A horrible thought struck Harry, as horrible thoughts always do when you're nervous. What if he wasn't chosen at all? What if he just sat there with a the hat over his eyes for ages until Professor McGonagall jerked off his head and said there had obviously been a mistake and he'd better get back on the train? When Neville Longbottom, the boy who kept losing his toe, was called, he fell over on his way to the stall. The hat took a long time to decide with Neville. When it finally shouted Gryffindor, Neville ran off still wearing it and had to jog back amidst gales of laughter to give it to McDougal Morag. Malfoy swaggered forward when his name was called and got his wish at once. The hat had barely touched his head when it screamed, Slither him! Malfoy went to join his friends, Crabbe and Goyle, looking very pleased with himself. There weren't many people left now. Moon, not Parkinson, then a pair of twin girls, Patil and Patil, then Perk, Sally Ann, and then, at last, Potter, Harry. As Harry stepped forwards, whispers suddenly broke out, like little hissing fires all over the hall. Potter, did she say, the Harry Potter? The last thing Harry saw before the hat dropped over his eyes was the hall full of people craning to get a good look at him. Next second, he was looking at the black inside of the hat. He waited. Hmm, said a small voice in his ear. Difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind either. There's talent. Oh my goodness, yes. And a nice thirst to prove yourself. Now that's interesting. So where shall I put you? Harry gripped the edges of the stall and thought, not Slytherin, not Slytherin. Not Slytherin, eh, said the small voice. Are you sure? You could be great, you know. It's all here in your head. And Slytherin, Slytherin will help you on the way to greatness. No doubt about that. No. Well, if you're sure, better be Gryffindor. Harry heard the hat shout the last word down the hall. He took off his hat and walked shakily towards the Gryffindor table. He was so relieved to have been chosen and not put in Slytherin. He hardly noticed he was getting the loudest cheer yet. Percy the Prefect got up and shook his hand vigorously, while the Weasley twins yelled, We got Potter! We got Potter! Harry sat down opposite the ghost in the rough he'd seen earlier. The ghost patted his arm, giving Harry a sudden, horrible feeling. He just plunged it into a bucket of ice-cold water. He could see the high table properly now. At the end nearest him sat Hagrid, who caught his eye and gave him the thumbs up. Harry grinned back, and there, in the centre of the high table, in a large gold chair, sat Albus Dumbledore. Harry recognised him at once from the card he got out of the chocolate frog on the train. Dumbledore's silver hair was the only thing in the whole hall that shone as brightly as the ghosts. Harry spotted Professor Quirrell too, the nervous young man from the Leaky Cauldron. He was looking quite peculiar in a large purple turban. And now there were only three people left to be sorted. Turpin, Lisa, became a Ravenclaw. And then it was Ron's turn. He was pale and green by now. Harry crossed his fingers under the table and a second later the hat had shouted, Gryffindor! Harry clapped loudly with the rest as Ron collapsed into the chair next to him. Well done, Ron, excellent, said Percy Weasley pompously across Harry as Zanib Blaze was made of Slytherin. Professor McGonagall rolled up her scroll and took the sourcing hat away. Harry looked down at the empty gold plate. He had only just realised how hungry he was. The pumpkin pasties seemed ages ago. Albus Dumbledore had got to his feet. He was beaming at the students. His arms opened wide as if nothing could have pleased him more than to welcome them here. Welcome, he said. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our banquet, I would like to say a few words. And they are, Nitwick, Blubber, Oddment, Tweak. Thank you. He sat back down. Everyone clapped and cheered. How he didn't know whether to laugh or not. Is he a bit mad? Asked, he asked Percy uncertainly. Mad, said Percy airily. He's a genius, best wizard in the world. But he is a bit mad. Yes, potatoes, Harry? Harry's mouth fell open. The dishes in front of him were now piled with food. He had never seen so many things he liked to eat at one table. 
roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops, lamb chops, sausages, bacon, steak, boiled potatoes, roast potatoes, chips, Yorkshire puddings, peas, carrots, gravy, ketchup, and for some strange reason, mint humbugs. The Dursleys had never exactly starved Harry, but he'd always been allowed to eat as much as he liked. But, sorry, but he'd never been allowed to eat as much as he liked. Daddy had always taken anything that Harry really wanted, even if it made him sick. Harry piled his plate with a bit of everything except the humbugs and began to eat. It was delicious. That does look good, said the rove and the ghost in the rough, sadly, watching Harry cut up his steak. Can't you? I haven't eaten for nearly 400 years, said the ghost. I don't need to, of course, but one does miss it. I don't think I've introduced myself. Sir Nicholas de Mincy Borgagon, at your service, resident ghost of the Gryffindor Tower. I know who you are, said Ron suddenly. My brother's told me about you. You're nearly headless Nick. I'd prefer you to call me Sir Nicholas de Mimsy, the ghost began stiffly, but sandy haired Seamus Finnegan interrupted. Nearly headless? How can you be nearly headless? Sir Nicholas looked extremely miffed, as if their little chat wasn't going the way he wanted. Like this, he said irritably. He seized his left ear and pulled. His whole head swung off his neck and fell on his shoulder as if it was on a hinge. Somebody had obviously tried to behead him, but they had not done it properly. Looking pleased at the stunned looks on their faces, nearly headless Nick flipped his head back on his neck and coughed. <coughs> so, new Gryffindors, I hope you're going to help us win the house championship this year. Gryffindor, I've never gone so long without winning. Slytherin have got the cup six years in a row. The bloody Baron's becoming almost unbearable. He's the Slytherin ghost. Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and saw a horrible ghost sitting there with blank eyes, a gaunt face and robes stained with silver blood. He was right next to Malfoy, who, Harry was pleased to see, didn't look too pleased with the seating arrangements. How did he get covered in blood? asked Seamus with great interest. I've never asked, said nearly headless Nick delicately. When everyone had eaten as much as they could, the remains of the food faded from the plates, leaving them sparkling clean as before. A moment later, the puddings arrived. Blocks of ice cream in every flavour you could think of. Apple pies, treacle tarts, chocolate eclairs and jam donuts. Trifles, strawberries, jelly, rice pudding. As Harry helped himself to a treacle tart, the talk turned to their families. I'm half and half, said Seamus. My dad's a muggle. Mam didn't tell him she was a witch until they were married. Bit of a nasty shock for him. The others laughed. What about you, Neville? said Ron. Well, my grand brought me up and she's a witch, said Neville, but the family thought I was muggle for ages. My great uncle Albie kept trying to catch me off my guard and force some magic out of me. He pushed me the, the, off the end of Blackpool Pier once. I nearly drowned, but nothing happened until I was eight. Great Uncle Algie came round for tea and he was hanging me out of an upstairs window by the ankles when my great auntie Enid offered him a meringue and he accidentally let go. But I bounced all the way down the garden and into the road. She was, they were all really pleased. Gran was crying. She was so happy. They were all, you should have seen their faces when I got there. They thought I might not be magic enough to come, you see. Great Uncle Algie was so pleased he brought in my toad. On Harry's other side, Percy Weasley and Hermione were talking about lessons. I do hope they start straight away. There's so much to learn. I'm particularly interested in transfiguration, you know, turning something into something else. Of course, it's supposed to be very difficult. You'll be starting small, so matches into needles, that sort of thing. Harry, who was starting to feel warm and sleepy, looked up at the high table again. Hagrid was drinking deeply from his goblet. Professor McGonagall was talking to Professor Dumbledore. Professor Quirrell, in his absurd turban, was talking to a teacher with greasy black hair, a hooked nose and sallow skin. It happened quite suddenly. The hooked nosed teacher looked past Quirrell's turban straight into Harry's eyes and a sharp, hot pain shot across the scar on Harry's forehead. Ouch! Harry clapped a hand to his head. What is it? asked Percy. N nothing. The pain had gone as quickly as it had come. Harder to shake off was the feeling Harry had got from the teacher's look. A feeling that he didn't like Harry at all. Who's that teacher talking to Professor Quirrell? he asked. Oh, you know Quirrell, don't you? No wonder he's looking so nervous. That's Professor Snape. He teaches potions, but he doesn't want to. Everyone knows he's after Quirrell's job knows an awful lot about the dark arcs, the snape. Right, your task today is to imagine, okay, the feast at Hogwarts 
and to draw a picture of what you would like in a feast and maybe do some um, description of it as well. So anything you like, anything you'd like on your table. Okay, well done.